Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. And thank you for allowing us to do work that we find meaningful. Thank you for giving us the most valuable commodity you have, your attention. We promise to do our very best to give you a return on it. Today we have Justin Hewn of Uranium Insider. Justin studies the supply-demand fundamentals of uranium, so much so that their model portfolio is up over 400% since inception. Justin, thank you for coming back on the show. It's my pleasure, Steve. Good to see you again. Good to see you too, sir. Um, all right, let's start out as we always do. And what is your macro view of the uranium market as it sits today? Broad view. Um, I'm honestly kind of getting that bullish feeling again right now. Um, we had a good pullback in the equities and the spot price. The spot price actually pulled back more than the equities, which if you've been following this market for a while, is sort of anomalous action. Most of the time when the sector washes out and the spot price stalls out or comes back down, you'll see the equities sell off hard. And in this case, it, for the most part, it wasn't that steep of a sell-off. We had most equities, the ETFs, for example, selling off somewhere between 15 and 20%. With the spot price falling, it peaked out in the second week of February, if I recall correctly, around $106, $106.50, I think was the high print mid-market, pulled all the way down to 84. So we actually have the equities pretty significantly outperforming the spot mark, spot price year to date. So the spot price actually is down year to date, even though it doesn't feel like that. And the equities are up. And so I'm very pleased to see this outperformance action. It's been a while. And honestly, the last time we really saw a meaningful move in the equities substantially outperforming the spot price really was kind of the beginning of this bull market. So December, 2020 through let's say March, April, 2021. Um, and there's been some fits and starts since then, but for the most part, the equities have relatively underperformed um, compared to the spot price uranium. So we had a good little reset. The uh, investing community and the equities sort of took some profits, took a little breather. Same thing happened in the physical market, right? So you had the spot price go on an absolute tear. It went from in the 50s back in August of last year. And in less than six months, it doubled. And so that kind of move is historically very, very large. And it takes time for these moves to digest. So a lot of the players that had been speculating in the spot market in you know November, December, January sort of stepped back. The utility stepped back. Everything was quiet. Spot market was dead there was no pounds being traded sometimes for many days in a row. You had the price drop at one point, the big drop that went from about 90 bucks to 84. I think it was a five or $6 drop in a single day. That was on a hundred thousand pounds being offered from a single trader. Um, so we then it bottomed out. We're starting to see some volume pick back up in the spot market again. And interestingly, what's really happening right now is the term market is getting very, very active. People that we uh, communicate with who are, physical traders, uh, commodities brokers, um, folks that have worked in the industry for decades are saying that it's the busiest that in some cases they have ever seen the term market. So even though the official pounds uh, sold in or contracted in the term market year to date is about 23 million pounds, still a pretty slow start compared to last year. There is a lot of activity, a lot of conversations happening on or off market, a lot of RFPs, tenders in the market, so the term market is heating up. My big takeaway from that is that the industry, let's say the nuclear utilities to speak generally, are accepting the present pricing reality and coming back to the table. So the pause that we saw late February, early March was kind of like, okay, that got kind of crazy pretty quickly. Let's step back and see where this settles out. Well, they saw where it settled. It settled out at 84 bucks. That probably, knock on wood, was probably the bottom in the spot market. Unless we see some really motivated selling, but we're not seeing that. Um, and now they're coming back to the table and signing contracts in this pricing environment. That is to say, floors around the spot price, ceilings north of $100 and sometimes substantially so. And even discussions of some contracts with no ceilings at all. So that's really interesting. Term market's heating up. Equities uh, are looking very good. Had a huge day yesterday. Today, they're actually rebounding quite nicely. I think Sput is actually raising some cash today. Not huge volumes, but I think it's something. So we'll take it. And there's a lot of very interesting trends happening right now in terms of 
the growth of, let's say, AI and data centers and the expected demand for electricity. But that is also just part of an increasing trend in electricity demand from multiple drivers that's expected to potentially be a tailwind for nuclear. So um, all of that is to say, I think that the pullback that we've just experienced is probably over both in the physical market and in the equities. And I think we're a few days, maybe a week into the next leg here. Okay. So the spot pulled back from about 106 uh, all the way down to, to 84, although there was very, very little volume in there. So, so little so that there was one day where it had 100,000 pounds, and that is pretty much the minimum amount that people buy or that utilities buy, and that moved the market uh, by five or six bucks. Uh, the term market is pretty active. Spot is super tight, and the equities are outperforming uh, the uh, <clears throat> the spot price of uranium. Here's URNM uh, divided by the spot price of uranium, and, and what you're talking about here is essentially from there to there. So when this goes up, that means the equities are outperforming uh, spot and when it goes down it's the opposite so this is what you're talking about here that the uh, uh the stocks are doing better than the spot price exactly yeah and you can see that across the 20 day above the 50 day i mean these are shorter term moving moving averages so i don't yep. really take a a broad view based on this but if you if you look at previous times where the right where the 20 day crossed above a rising 50 day it's happened a few times in this chart that usually meant there was at least a decent run for multiple weeks if not multiple months we're starting to see that now finally closing back above that 200 day which is flattening out um possibly even starting to maybe peak its head up if we're above a rising 200 day in this chart that's technically bullish once we get the 50 day above that i think it's game on either way this is looking great i'm i'm, I'm very happy to see this this is one of those charts where if you're constructive on the future prospects for the commodity itself, which we obviously are, this could go straight sideways. We're going to be very happy. So to see the equities outperform spot, if we can have that happen and have spot running, which is not at the moment, that means a rip roaring equities bull market. So we're not quite there yet, but this is certainly looking more constructive than it has over the past number of months. Yeah, very exciting. Very exciting. Um, okay, let's go into, we've talked about principal risks before. Uh, user wants to know, um, can you state the strongest arguments uh, for the uranium bears? So uh, maybe list a, a couple of the um, um, principal risks. You know, one of the, I would say the most reasonable bearish argument really is just kind of looking at the cyclicality of a commodities investment cycle, right? So, I mean, the classic is that the price overshoots, supply responds, the price drops, supply pulls back, rinse and repeat, right? And this happens with every commodity and it always cycles. The, the commodities investing, that's why it's just so fun because you can you can predict these cycles on, on pretty, I mean, it's not always that easy to predict, but uranium is one of those where the to model out demand is relatively simple. It's there's a vast number of reactors and to drill into each one of those and understand how long they'll be operating for and how much uranium they're consuming. That's a long winded exercise, but all that information is out there. So you can model out that demand pretty easily. Um, and then the supply side, it's a little bit trickier, but it's also, there's just so few actual producers, you know, a, a spreadsheet with 50 lines is going to give you every single imagine possible possible imaginable production over the next 20 years and you can model that out relatively easily so i would say that the bearish take that is most reasonable would be that supply is going to respond to a higher price environment and eventually the price is going to fall true that will happen 100 percent, that will happen and there's every incentive right now for development projects to move towards production the pricing environment is there you're seeing majors discuss investing a lot of money in expanding their production. Cameco is a good example. In their conference call, they mentioned, and they just released uh, uh, an analysis of doing so, which is the expansion of Cigar Lake. They plan to expand Cigar Lake into, quote unquote, phase two, because phase one of Cigar will be done producing by the end of the decade. Phase two is going to cost Cameco. Their share of, of, uh, of that expansion will be close to $300 million. They're not going to do this for no reason. They're going to do it because they see a rising price environment in as far out as they can see into the future. 
but we will see supply respond. So the biggest bearish take, I think at this point we can bury, which is Kazakhstan will just open the taps and flood the market and, and bull market over. That's not happening. Um, not only am I saying that, the company is saying that. And the company is telling you exactly what's happening. They're telling you their production increase was expected for 2024, not going to happen. It's pretty much in line with last year. I actually think there's even a risk that they might underproduce from the numbers of last year based on the situation on the ground in the country, especially in terms of sulfuric acid availability. Then they also are saying that they expect their CapEx expenditure for the year, for 2024, to be um, almost exactly in line with their expectation in rising costs or their all-in sustaining costs. I think it was around 26% the increase in CapEx and a 26% increase in their AISE. Essentially what that means is on balance, they're not expanding their CapEx during 2024. That's what they're telling us. So we obviously have to watch this quarter over quarter to get a more accurate read on what they'll be producing in 2025. But the numbers that they released last September were that they expected to produce 25 and a half thousand tons of uranium in 2024. Now they're saying 21,000, right? It's all 10 million pounds less. And they expected to produce 30 and a half to 31 and a half thousand tons in 2025. That's what they said back in September. Now they've already adjusted that down, calling into question 2025's ramp. I can tell you right now, they don't expand CapEx in 2024. They don't expand production in 2025. It's not conspiracy theory. You have to put the money in the ground in order to pull the uranium out of the ground in greater quantities. So sulfuric acid availability is the primary driver of this. Um, there's no reason to pour a bunch of money in expanding well fields if you're not going to have the acid to eject into those well fields. So that continues to be a pinch point in the country. Long story short, they're not going to be saving the market with production in the next few years. They expect the new sulfuric acid production facility that they have just started to construct over the last month to be operational by late 2026, early 2027. If that happens, then we will see increased production in 2028. If they can't increase their imports of sulfuric acid from Russia or the amount of acid they're getting from from producers in Kazakhstan, between now and then, we're not going to see that production ramp until then. So that area, 2027, 8, 9, is really this period of time where the market is expecting a lot of production to come, right? So that'll be not only from Kazatom Prom's uh, potential increase in production, but also from potentially from NextGen's Arrow, from Denison's Phoenix, and from some other various smaller production, Global Atomics DASA, all of these projects, the market is expecting to be producing around that time. So I guess the bearish take would be 2027, 2028. Production will uh, meet uh, demand in that year, a snapshot of that year. We're going to see the price fall. That's the bearish take. Do I think that's going to happen? No, I don't. Do I have a crystal ball? No, I don't. But the way that this market works is that even if you have a market balance for a point in time doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see negative price drivers in the physical market. All that means is this snapshot of a balanced market. Um, maybe there's a bit more liquidity in the near term at that point, especially if some of these larger producers don't contract out that supply. I, we expect during the process of the, the development of the Rook one, by next gen, they're going to be contracting some of their supply. <laughs> what those contracts are going to look like at that point, who knows? Probably largely market reference with very high ceilings, if ceilings at all. Um, but I don't expect to see negative pressure on the price until and unless we see supply outpace demand for a sustained period of time. I don't know when that happens. The demand, the demand growth that we're seeing now is far greater than what we expected just going a few years back. So we're looking at four, four to 5%, potentially even more, if everything goes as planned in China and India, for example, compound annual growth rate in nuclear and therefore uranium demand. That's huge. That's a massive growth rate for such a slow moving industry, generally speaking. So considering that demand growth, considering the 
understanding that the industry has right now of the nuclear renaissance, let's call it, utilities are signing longer contracts and higher volumes. So the discussions that are on the table right now are going far into the 2030s, mid to late 2030s for some of these uh, tenders. There's one right now coming from the Slovaks that's uh, 2026 to 2039, if I recall correctly, um, 21 million pounds. That's a huge, and that's an RFP they just put in the market. Like, hey, we're willing to buy up to this much for this period of time. Who's got it? It's basically how it's working. So the industry thinks in terms of decades and utilities buy for the next decade if they have uh, confidence that their facility will be operating. So life extensions ex extend, uh, life extensions can move supply and demand modeling substantially. Just yesterday or two days ago, Steve, uh, there's an article about the South Koreans intending to life extend all 10 reactors of theirs that were set to shut down by 2030. 10 reactors are going to be life extended. That was not expected. That was not put into anyone's models. If you were super bullish and you can read the tea leaves, then maybe you would have put that in. But most of the time when you're doing these supply and demand models, you're generally conservative on the demand side. So until and unless the country says we are extending this reactor, you don't plug in that demand. Big shift. That means the South Koreans are going to be in the market buying even more uranium. So I don't know exactly what the future brings, but at some point we're going to have a high enough price sustained for a long enough period of time that we'll see a lot of development projects on the ground. And we'll probably see some innovation eventually, maybe mid mid 2030s and beyond, we'll see commercial seawater extraction or uh, phosphate extracted uranium coming from phosphate tails in the US and China, or actually coming out of the ground in Morocco. All of these things are going to have to happen if we're going to meet the demand that's projected by some of these loftier quote unquote climate goals, right? Tripling nuclear by 2050, for example. That's an enormous ask, not only for the mined uranium, but for the fuel cycle in general. So we're just gonna have to see how this all pans out. For the time being, two and a half billion pounds of uncovered uranium demand going out to 2040 based on conservative modeling of demand right now, not based on SMR demand, not based on financial demand, not based on most countries life extending their fleet out to 60 plus years. All of these things can have a, a pretty significant effect, but very conservatively modeling out existing reactor demand under construction that will hit the grid in the next five years. And what does that look like? How much buying is on the table? We expect even if you if you see a balanced market for a year or two, 28, 29, which we don't, we think that the de demand is there that could, to to potentially keep the price lofty. But again, we'll have to see how it pans out. Things can shift, political winds can shift. We don't really know, but that's how we're seeing it right now. And all of the signs are pointing towards that. Okay, um, so it, this is extremely cyclical. cyclical and uh, I've certainly noticed that and that uh, all, all across Twitter when it was at 105, uh, we were getting rocket ships. And then I started getting hate mail when it got into the 80s. So that was that was a cue to buy. Um, we've got uh, uh, as far as more supply coming online, uh, that's really probably not going to happen, and it's certainly not going to happen from Kazakhstan. Uh, they basically missed their projections by 10 million pounds. I thought that was kind of interesting. 26 percent uh, more capital expenditures, and also 26 percent increase in all-in sustaining costs. Um, they uh, largely by the uh, tight uh, sulfuric acid market. And one curveball that got thrown was South Korea uh, life extending uh, 10 of their nuclear reactors. So uh, like you and other guys didn't have this in your in your forecast, right? Correct. Okay, yeah. that's that's good. So as far as supply starting to catch up with what we're what we're needing with demand, probably not going to see that until at least 2027, maybe 2028 or 2029. For the big new greenfield projects, that's really what we're talking and actual expansion in Kazakhstan. That's that's when we start to see a lot of supply respond. We're seeing supply respond now. I mean, Boss is producing a little from Honeymoon. Encore is producing a little from Rosita and Alta Mesa in the next few months. Um, Cameco is increasing production at MacArthur. Paladin just started producing. Um, they just got first cake in the can uh, over the last few days, they announced. 
Um, you know, Global Atomic still trying to develop DASA despite all the issues in Niger. Other companies are are moving towards production in the United States. The Uzbeks are increasing, although they they refine that down, uh, revise that down from doubling production by 2030 to a 50% increase. But it's still it's marginal. BHP, we see gold stay high and we see copper start to rise. Olympic Dam is going to produce more uranium, maybe a million pounds or two, two million pounds more per year in the next couple of years it's possible. So all of these little incremental supply, they are adding up. So they are, we are increasing supply. That is happening. So I'm not going to be the one out there saying there's no supply response. No new mines are happening. That, that's not the truth. The truth is that supply is responding. But demand also is growing, and demand is growing faster than supply is responding. And so until we have either one of two things happen, demand levels off and or supply drastically responds, we're unlikely to see negative pressure on the price. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Anil wants to know, he says... Um, how long does a reactor take to restart once the decision has been made uh, to shut it down? And how long after that restart decision must they buy fuel for fabricating and loading? For example, Palisades restart decision recently, when would they consider purchasing for loading? So the, these things, they don't want to uh, uh, shut it down and turn it back on, and they can't do that. This is a long process to shut it down, a long process to restart it. It's not like a dam where you can just divert the water, work on your thing, and then kick it back on. Um, maybe go through that process. Uh, well, it's hard to go through that process because it hasn't happened before. Okay. Um, but... I, the, the, the easy answer is it would depend on how long ago the reactor shut down and how how far into the decommissioning process the reactor is. So to give you one example, Germany shut down their entire fleet, right? They don't have any operating reactors any longer. They shut down three this past year. They shut down three the year before that. They shut down two a couple of years prior to that. And then the other shutdowns are multiple, many years into decommissioning. So Mark Nelson and his team with Radiant Energy Group went over to Germany, did their own independent analysis on the German fleet and determined that eight of their reactors technically could still be restarted. So I think there's a lot of factors that you would have to drill into the individual reactor. In the case of Palisades, they haven't started really decommissioning yet. So even though it was shut down last year, um, or excuse me, it was uh, uh, 2022, mid 2022 that it, that it was shut down. There hasn't been much, if any, decommissioning done, physical dismantling of the plant. And what they are saying, what Holtec, the operator is saying is it will be operational late 2025. So that restart will take a year and a half, 18 months um, to get that restarted. Assuming that they do officially make that decision now that the federal government has officially said they are offering a one and a half billion dollar loan to Holtec for that restart. It looks like it's going to happen. Um, when will they be in the market buying fuel? As soon as they 100% know this is happening, they'll be out there buying buying fuel and, and not before then. It's not going to be a speculative purchase. Uranium is expensive right now and everything across the fuel cycle is expensive. But as soon as it for sure is happening, then they'll be in the market buying fuel for that reactor. Um, so it's hard to say to speak generally on it because it hasn't really happened. Um, but guaranteed, they expected to close that reactor down, so they ran inventories down. Um, and if not, sold any potential inventory to the market prior to that happening. So they'll have to be back in the market. It's not a, it's, it's a single reactor, so it's not an incredible amount of demand, but it's something. Okay, and that kind of goes into G. Harder's question. Um, there's about 60 re reactors currently under construction. When did they purchase uranium? Is it two or three years before, or is it way before, or just before? Um, it's usually at least two or three years before. Well, uranium itself, I would argue, is probably three to four years before, because they're going to have to run it through the fuel cycle before they get fabricated fuel um, with a decently long lead time before uh, before actual grid connection and first criticality. So um, it also would depend on the reactor builder or the reactor operator after that first grid connection. So uh, the Chinese, for example, have obviously a lot of inventory. So yeah, these Chinese reactors that are under construction, hard to really say how much buying, if any, the operators of those reactors are going to have to do in the next five years for all of their grid connections. 
but some of these other reactors being built in India and elsewhere um, are going to have to be in the market, you know, three or four years prior to that first grid connection. Okay. That's got to go in line with the, the banks too, that are funding this. They're like, Hey, uh, secure some supply before we can fund you. I imagine. Right. I would imagine that that makes sense. Yes. And that first, the, so the first load of fuel is actually two to three times the volume of a, of a core change. So of that annual demand. So the annual demand roughly at let's say 0.25 tails for one gigawatt nuclear reactor is about 450 to 475,000, maybe a little bit more pounds of uranium per year. The initial load will be one to one and a half million pounds of uranium. So okay. that first that initial core load for new reactors is a pretty significant demand. Okay. Yeah, they want to keep years of this stuff on on supply because they they can't shut them down. Okay. Right. Uh, Patrick and Flo kind of have a similar question. Both uh, one on Cameco, one on Kazatomprom, and it's basically um, is since since they're falling short of their projections, and uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier that they're going out into the spot market. Uh, to actually secure some U three hundred eight, because you know they've written contracts that they have to they they have to fill, and so they're actually buyers of uh, of U three hundred eight. Is that is that still the case? To some extent, yes. To some extent, no. Um, Cameco, I I sort of fade Cameco's statements on how much uranium they have to buy. They make it as confusing as possible. They count some of their production from, let's say, for example, their Inkai JV, they count as purchases. So when they say we need to buy 11 million pounds this year, they don't need to buy 11 million pounds in the spot market. And judging by their inventories, their ability to borrow, uh, they don't, I don't think they need to buy any uranium in the market. I think that they just say this to the market because they want the market to understand that if the price gets low enough, they're going to be buyers and they will. But as far as uh, you know, the investors always seem to want the most extreme type of of language and catalyst. They they want they want everything to flood in Kazakhstan, and they want tornadoes, and they want earthquakes, and they want uh, they want to know that Cameco is just going to panic buy in the spot market, and they're not. Okay, so what are they doing? They're increasing production at MacArthur. It's going to take a few years, but they'll probably get there. They're expanding Cigar, so Cameco's production miss last year largely had to do with automations and upgrading that they're doing at the McLean Lake Mill, which is why Cigar produced um, significantly less than their targets. I don't think that's going to be a permanent situation for them. I think Cigar will bounce back, but is it going to be able to produce 18 million pounds year over year until the mine is done? Probably not. Will they try to expand into Cigar Lake Phase 2 at the same time Phase 1 is declining to maintain that roughly that nameplate capacity? Probably. Uh, MacArthur, they'll be able to achieve 25 million pounds a year out of MacArthur on a 100% basis, but it's probably going to take three to five years in order to accomplish that. Um, but they'll get there, And but they have a robust contract book to produce into. They don't sell on the spot market ever, but they also don't need to panic buy either. Um because that Prom is a little bit more of a black box. My understanding is that they have had to buy in the spot market a little bit. Perhaps they will also uh, going forward this year. Their production costs are so low that if they can produce, if they can increase production as they are hoping to be able to do, they're going to do that first rather than um, you know buy uranium at ninety dollars a pound. They'd rather produce it at forty. So they're, you know, as their fully allocated costs, including dividends, their cash costs are much lower. But um, so they, I also don't think they need to panic into the market either. So will both companies be small buyers on the margins? Probably, probably. Is it noteworthy that either of these companies has to buy anything as the biggest producers in the world? Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. So um, if... Because Adam Prom has bought anything in the spot market. They're not just doing that for fun. So there's a reason for it. And there's a reason that Cameco had to do some buying as well. Um, a lot of it has to do with the flexing up that they, both companies have experienced by utilities. Um, all utilities are flexing up their contracts to the extent that the contracts allow, electing to receive more material than they had initially signed on for, sometimes up to 20% more. 
And that's squeezed the near term for every single producer in the, in the world right now. So is this a permanent phenomenon? No. Uh, are they going to be panic buyers in the market? No. Will there be buyers on the margin? Maybe keeping things somewhat aloft, perhaps. But also, you know, Cameco has sort of that line in the sand where you get above, I think it was 90, low 90s a pound. Um, then they start to lose money if they have to buy in the spot market and deliver into contracts. So down at this level for high 80s, maybe they've been nibbling in the past you know, few weeks. That's possible. They're not going to come out and say it. But um, yeah, not a, not a major catalyst. It's noteworthy that the biggest producers in the world are also buyers. That's, of course, noteworthy. But I'm not expecting either company to just come in and slam the spot market and push the price up. Okay, so the rumors of them just coming in and scooping up millions of pounds are probably not valid. But if there's a, a, a little arbitrage or something, they, they, they might take advantage of a, of, a, of a tiny bit. Sure. And I mean, because Adam Prom has much more leverage to rising prices than Cameco based on their current contract book right now. But they also are such a low cost producer, it doesn't really make sense for them to buy in the market. And for them just to maintain production levels right now is a challenge. And every single time they miss production, spot price jumps up 10 or 20 bucks and they make uh, money hand over fist. So um, I'm not saying that their production misses was intentional. Um, I'm not necessarily going there. But they don't need to buy in the spot market to keep the price aloft. It, it's producer buying is not needed to keep this market up. The demand is across the board. The trajectory is clear. Prices are going higher. Everybody knows it. So there, it's not needed for these guys to artificially try to keep the price up. Okay. And uh, the Czar, Russ, and Jag, and a couple other people were asking about uh, the recent flooding in Kazakhstan. So if, if you've been watching Twitter, you can see that there's been some pretty radical floods in uh, Kazakhstan. I'm going to share my screen here. And John Quakes put up a uh, neat little diagram. And he basically said, uh, does, um, uh, does any of this um, uh, affect you know, uh, ISR. So bas basically, maybe you can go into uh, in situ recovery and how, how it's, uh, uh, how it works. But, you know, if we have surface flooding up here, is that affecting anything uh, uh, down below as far as extracting uh, the uranium? I imagine if there's actual flooding happening at the actual well field, that probably would interrupt production. I think that's a pretty easy statement to make. Um, how this works it's an aquifer there is uranium embedded in the ore that the aquifer is traveling through um, in this case in this particular graph it's below the aquifer um, so basically they inject sulfuric acid into the ore body and then they extract it after it has binded with the uranium and it goes to a processing facility after it comes out of the recovery well and rinse and repeat and so they have to drill these all the time because, as you can imagine, the flow of the lixivian that has the impregnated solution, right, the sulfuric acid that contains uranium, goes just in one direction between the injection well and the recovery well. Yeah. So, And the ore body, obviously, in many cases, goes in many directions in various depths. So you have to drill these wells all the time. In fact, from the point that a well field is drilled to the point where it's basically not producing anymore is about two years, two and a half years. So, and it takes 12 months to get first sort of initial production, eight to 12 months, peak production about 18 months, then it declines really rapidly. There's ongoing drilling happening. I have not heard that there's actual flooding at any of their actual well fields. So um, my, my broad take is that this is probably not a huge interrupting event i would probably guess that the most interruption will happen simply in the movement of materials and people so just basic infrastructure could be impacting um, the movement of material and, and skilled labor across the various areas of kazakhstan but my understanding is most of the flooding is happening in the north and most of their operations are in the south so um, i don't think it's much of a disruption that would be my 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 broad take on it. We have not yet to hear that their production has been impacted by this. It's obviously not helping. 
So um, I don't think it's making anything easier. So yeah. to the extent that a delivery of sulfuric acid is delayed or um, if uh, certain skilled uh, professionals cannot get to where they need to be on a, by a certain time, that might delay things, things like that. But I wouldn't expect this to be, you know, on par with the Cigar Lake flood in, in 2005. It's nothing like that, in my opinion. Okay, so if we have some surface flooding up here, it's it uh, that may... Uh... Or across the country, it could interrupt logistics as far as just moving and transporting the stuff, getting people from point A to point B. But as far as it messing up this process here, the, where you're ejecting it all the way down to the ground, pulling it out, unless you've got some massive flooding around the processing facility, this is probably just a, a, a nothing burger. I think that it would have to be some pretty substantial flooding, right? Because, I mean, it rains... And it's like not like water on the surface is going to impact operations. But if we're talking about multiple feet of water flooding across an area, I'm sure that would negatively impact a well field. I have not heard that that is happening. Okay. All right. Well, that's good news. Um, all righty. Uh, Mick wants to know, Justin, how quickly can the U.S. build enrichment facilities? Until this is done, how can a Russian ban be possible? So most of the uh, uh, conversion and enrichment is, is done in Russia, and now our big thinkers have decided to uh, sanction them, and it looks like that's going to pass. Um, do we have the capacity? How, how is that going to work out? Big thinkers, indeed. Um, so, well, Russia doesn't have most of the capacity, but they are the biggest players, right? So they've got, what, 40, 43% of enrichment, global enrichment, and 39% of conversion, something like that, within a couple percentage points. So they're the biggest player. Um, how is the ban possible? The ban is possible because the utilities have largely covered their needs for the short term. And the U.S. is offering up funding to support the domestic fuel cycle. So are there a few utilities that are still reliant on future deliveries of enriched uranium coming from Russia in the United States? Yes. Will they be able to source it elsewhere? That remains a question. That is why this legislation has proposed to have waivers in it that will allow utilities to continue to receive that material going forward if they can't source it elsewhere. Um, my understanding is that the industry is not very relieved by this offering of waivers, but most of the big utilities are covered. Um, the U.S. utilities, generally speaking, pulled forward a lot of future deliveries of enrichment over the last 18 to 24 months from Russia. So they elected to receive this material sooner. Um, we heard that they bought a little bit of your enriched uranium from the Chinese in Q4. We don't think that's something that's going to be ongoing. There's a, still a 30% tariff on Chinese imported uranium. Wow. So, um, yeah, that was a Trump era thing that the Biden admin continued. So um, that's not a solution. But the signs are all there that this is probably going to happen. So what are those signs? Before this legislation passed the House back in November, it was supported by the NEI, the Nuclear Energy Institute in the United States, the largest you know, nonprofit nuclear um, advocacy group that is in constant communication with Washington and with the, with the utilities in the United States. So they were in support of that legislation. That was a big sign. As soon as word got out that they were in support of it, we saw a move in the physical market, interestingly enough. Then we saw it pass the House. Okay. Then it's been held up in the Senate since then. This is the, the legislation specifically to ban Russian uranium. Um, <clears throat> what are some other signs? The Department of Energy is now actually also in support of this ban, the DOE. So the department that I suppose you could argue is responsible for maintaining the electricity grid, uh, its general functionality in the United States, is supporting cutting off Russian material. Um, Secretary Granholm just a couple of weeks ago was speaking publicly about this. So the DOE is in support of it. The NEI is in support of it. If the NEI is support of it, in support of it, that means that utilities on balance are also. Okay. Um, lastly, the latest funding package from the Biden admin has 2.7 billion allocated to supporting domestic fuel cycle that is contingent on a ban happening, meaning this money is burning a hole in their pockets until this material is banned. They cannot allocate that funding unless and until that material is banned. So all of those things to me 
in addition to the fact that the U.S. utilities, again, speaking generally, are acting as if the ban is going to happen, right? So they take certain actions in the physical market. They pulled forward that material. They paid a 30% tariff to import some Chinese EUP and Q4. There's movements in the physical market happening now, especially on the term market side of things. They've secured a lot of uh, enrichment and conversion ex-Russia over the past 18 to 24 months, which is one of the reasons why we've seen the price explode for both of those services, especially 2022, first half of 2023. So all of these signs are pointing towards it's probably going to happen. Now, will that same legislation pass the House and get the president's signature? Will this element of that legislation banning Russian material be squeezed into a different piece of legislation? Or will it just be an executive order? I don't know. I also don't know if it happens next week or next month or two, three months from now. I don't know. All I can tell you is that all of the signals are pointing towards this is probably going to happen. Okay. Yeah. I remember when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine a couple of years ago, you were mentioning that uh, there's probably going to be a premium put on American uh, uranium companies. And uh, it looks like that is playing out. Um, that kind of goes into Ross's question. He says, uh, what does Justin think of United States ISR stocks? Um, what the, how do you feel about that? Generally speak, um, speaking, I like them. Um, I mean, you just look at, look at what's happening here with the, the unbelievable support from the federal government. Um, we still have legislation in place that did pass years ago for a domestic strategic reserve of uranium. And uh, the US federal government bought uranium from multiple companies in the United States last year, and that's going to continue. There's other legislation that I'm still trying to get clarity on in terms of, well, part of it is out there, right? This support for enrichment, that's going to be the federal government buying enrichment in order to support domestic enrichers. That's already out there. Um, the DOE has RFPs in the market right now for HALU. Um, and of course, with these RFPs, that material has to come from domestically sourced uranium. Um, the military can only use domestically sourced uranium. So still drilling into some analysis on that front. I don't want to speak too much on it, but let's just say that there's a potential for a significant demand coming from the U.S. federal government going forward that nobody is talking about or calculating but I don't want to say any more about that until I until I have that uh, fully fleshed out. Um, but yes, clearly, clearly, there's a lot of momentum for supporting U.S. Uh, domestically produced uranium. So, um, generally speaking, I like them. I don't like all of them, but I like I like a few. Okay. Um, all right. Urban appraisal is asking. Uh, the spot market is very illiquid, and there is a large looming deficit. I'm interested to know when we will start to see the utilities that are short in 2024 start to look for pounds. When does this uh, 30 to 40 million pound deficit factor, factor into the market? So the deficit that we're talking about between supply and demand doesn't mean utilities are short that amount. Those are two different things. Um, generally speaking, nobody is short uranium utilities no utilities are short uranium this year, right? So, I mean, this year you're burning through fuel that you loaded last year or the year before. Um, so there's there aren't really any utilities that are going to need to panic buy in the short term. The exceptions to that are unexpected life extensions or a restart, for example. So if, if Palisades 100% is going to be restarted and that decision is, is, is made... For sure, in the next coming months, we're probably going to see Holtec buying uranium uh, with near-term delivery. It doesn't mean they go in and just buy it off the spot market in one fell swoop, but that could mean an RFP looking for Q1 or Q2 of 2025 delivery, right? So that's effectively a spot market transaction at that point if it's less than 12 months. But the deficit that we're talking about is between mined supply and mine demand. And it matters because that deficit inherently relies on a drawing down of inventories. So if you take, it's it's really difficult to explain because 
if you have utilities buying uranium for 2035 and beyond right now, what does a 40 million pound deficit even matter this year as a snapshot? Well, it matters because the overall demand, you have to base it on an annual basis. So you have to be able to model it somehow. So even though the demand does not often move in line with actual annual burnup rates, because you'll see utilities contract for far less and sometimes far more than that annual burn up rate, right? Is that has to do with cycles of inventory restocking and destocking. So there's um, restocking inventories often ironically come in a rising price environment because there's a perception of a shortage. And the perception of a shortage, like what do you do if you think there's gonna be a food shortage? You go to the store, you buy as much, as many cans of soup as you possibly can. That's sort of the same way that this works. It just happens more slowly. Um, and obviously, you have the smart preppers that got, have a pantry full of freeze-dried food and, and frozen meat and whatever, right? Um, and they're kind of set. So those are those smart utilities. And there's a few of them. There's a couple in the United States and there's a handful in Europe who have you know, three, four, maybe five years of inventory. That's pretty smart. And then there's others that are going to wait until they see news stories of fights at Costco over toilet paper, and then they're going to go out and buy, right? And, and the same dynamic happens here as well. So what, if you, if you look at UXC's supply and demand modeling, their graphics based on this modeling, basically that gap is made up an in inventory drawdown because it has to be right unless you're actually having utility not operating because they couldn't get the fuel somehow they're figuring it out so if it didn't come from direct purchases it came from drawing down inventory at some some level in the across the fuel cycle so if you go back over the last five years and you see this um secondary supply which uxc counts inventory drawdown as secondary supply and this is one of those things that's always been a little bit controversial in this market because inventory drawdown acts as secondary supply, but UXC also counted those pounds as primary production three, four, five years ago. And it's also production again as inventory drawdown. So it's a little bit facetious, but it also is sort of true. So you take that supply. If you know there's a 40 million pound deficit this year, you know that that deficit is plugged by inventory drawdowns, which means utilities, if they are not buying aggressively or covered sufficiently going out over the next few years, you're going to see their individual inventories start to fall. Of course, part of this general thesis is the last two times we saw big bull markets in the in the commodity itself, 1970s, and again, you know, 04 to 07, you also saw inventories being restocked, which means you saw volumes in the term market far greater than the annual burnup rate. So you had an annual burnup rate of 170 million pounds in 2005, and you sold 230 million pounds in the in the long term market. I think we're going to see that again this time around. So uncovered utilities, basically this market is pretty unique. You have very few players on the utility fuel buyer side of things that take it upon themselves to be particularly forward-looking and trying to, trying to make an educated guess on where the price will be in the future and not actually dictating their buying practices. That usually doesn't happen with rare exception. What usually happens is that a nuclear utility buys uranium when they have to buy uranium for their operations. And whatever the market prices are, they just go and then tell their manager, hey, if we want to buy and cover 2027 and 2023, 2032 from Cameco, we're going to have to pay a market reference contract with an 85 floor and $120 ceiling. The manager just says, damn, all right. That's pretty much kind of how it works. They just buy what they need to buy when they need to buy it. And it doesn't make sense to the investor mind because we're so obsessed with buy low, sell high. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. It's it's a small enough portion of the overall operating budget that it's they're not incentivized to try to time the market. And if they have been in the past, 
oftentimes that's worked worst worked against them, right? So if you signed a high price contract in 07, um, thinking the price is going to keep rising and then the GFC hit and all the financials dumped all their physical uranium in the market, uh, you know, six months later, if you signed a contract at 105 bucks, six months later, the term price was, you know, $75. Um, so trying to time the market has bit plenty of fuel buyers in the ass in the past, and it's not something that they generally do. So they buy uranium when they need to buy uranium. So if you're if a utility is uncovered in 2026, they're buying now. If it's uncovered in 2027, they're buying now and next year, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, you see, just generally speaking, the terms of these term contracts shifting. So in a bear market, they were much shorter, smaller volumes. Why? Because they could top up in the spot market, had decent inventories because everything was so cheap. Things shift now. Now we're seeing these contracts are going out much longer, seven to 10 plus years, higher volumes. Utilities are taking notice of the dynamic shift in the market and acting accordingly in, in the term market. So that adds to the overall dynamic of a supply shortfall is not only are we seeing the burn rate of global reactors being contracted, but we're going to see an excess of that due to inventories being rebuilt up. Okay, so <clears throat> this isn't as quick as what we all experienced during COVID when everyone was running to uh, Costco and loading up on everything. Uh, this takes a lot longer to uh, filter through the uh, filter through the market. Um, you know, each of these nuclear power plants has anywhere between two and three years of fuel. Uh, ready to go so it's not like uh you know this this 40 million pound deficit is just kind of spread and filtered throughout uh 436 reactors or however many we got um it's it's not like all of a sudden one utility uh just has nothing and they got to go in and, and just s slam the book down right there's always inventories there's always inventories to buffer moves in the market like we just saw which is why the utilities have the ability to step back step out of the market for six months come back when they think that things have settled out or when they decide that they aren't going to drop any further and they can start to discuss making contracts, which is what's happening right now. So there's always inventories. That's that's just how this industry operates. Inventories, generally speaking, are on the low end historically. But we don't necessarily need to have a panic moment for the utilities. A panic moment sort of is, is something that triggered a price spike in the previous market, which was Cigar Lake, which was expected to come online and be producing 18 million pounds a year, flooded and got delayed. And the Chinese were building and buying and then a bunch of utilities went, damn, let's get in there. We don't need that kind of moment. And it's not guaranteed that we'll have that type of like Costco toilet paper run type moment. Um, it could happen. I think if we see, let's say, force, force majeure being declared by a producer and actually not being able to deliver into a contract, that probably would trigger a panic in the market. I'm not necessarily expecting that, but I'm also looking at the, our own modeling of supply and demand and going, I'm not sure where this material is going to come from and how dire it could potentially get. It is possible that we do see that at some point, but our core investment thesis is certainly not around a, a Costco toilet paper run type moment. It's, it's around general demand growth, general supply constraint. Okay. Yeah. We as investors can see that we're burning uh, 185 million pounds a year and we're only pulling 145 out of the, out of the ground. So we see the writing on the wall. They don't really care. They just pay whatever they have to. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, all right. Elder catch wants to know, uh, is it my impression or does it feel like the U markets are thinking new mines and restarts are going to even out the supply demand over the next few years? So why should the spot market go into panic mode? And is this impacting the spot price and share prices? Um, I would say that that probably was a pretty decently accurate sentiment following the Cameco call. I think that really aided the pullback in the sector because what investors heard was more production. That's what they heard from Cameco. Increase in MacArthur and investment in expanding cigar. Um, so that, that probably was a stronger sentiment, let's say a month to a month and a half ago. Um, and I think we're going to go in waves. We're going to go in waves. And over the next few years, we're going to hear, you know, the announcement that next gen is going to start constructing the mine at Rook One. And that's probably going to cause some investors to bail. 
And that's okay. That makes the market, right? And so it doesn't matter necessarily that it's going to take them multiple years to build the mine if everything goes right. Then they'll be selling in the market, at which point we might still have a deficit. The price might be $100 higher than it is right now. Just thinking supply is coming is going to cause some investors to, to sell. So I would say that's probably a decent assumption. Um, I think that there's a lot of other tailwinds beyond a supply response, a basic supply response for the sector. Um, not only just general electricity demand being a tailwind, unexpected life extensions, the potential for a Russian ban. There's other stuff in the works. I think I think we still have a very long runway, but we're going to go through, you know, it's going to be a sinusoidal wave of higher highs and higher lows. And we're going to have plenty of moments, probably two or three every single year, where some piece of news will trigger a certain amount of the speculators in the space to bail out. All good, makes a market. Yeah, that's what we call buying opportunities. Um, Indeed. All right. Inconvenient Truth wants to know, how do you get a read on utilities inventory of uranium? Like what sources? For my research, utilities survived in the 2010s off large inventories and easy access to uranium. Then Sput came along buying in the spot market. It's a decent read. Um, yeah, a lot of inventories in the previous decade you know, a lot of cheap uranium in the previous decade. We figured that perhaps outside of China, so China topped up inventories a lot during the 20 teens. So if you take the excess production in the 20 in the 2010s and you make an assumption that China purchased probably a decent percentage of that, we figured there were probably somewhere to the tune of 150 million excess pounds that were floating around available to the open market globally um above ground mobile inventory that took some time to work through right so you had carry traders largely facilitated that utilities were buying two three year carry trades instead of going to cameco instead of going to orano instead of going to uranium one and just signing these carry trades with traders that would buy in the spot market and deliver into these contracts so utilities were able to top up inventories decently um in the previous decade with cheap material so Remind me the first part of that question. Oh, inventories. Okay, yeah. so um, in the U.S. every year, I think it's in June, if I recall correctly, the EIA puts out inventory numbers for uh, for the United States utilities. And generally speaking, they're on the low side. They're not on panic lows. I think that they they've bolstered those. Like I said, they pull forward material from Russia um, over the past couple of years, so they bolstered those a little bit, hovering right around two years, maybe a little bit more than two years on average. Um, across the whole space in the US. The EU, a uh, little bit harder to get those numbers, but you can find them. They have usually a minimum of three years inventory. Um, global commercial inventories are on the lower end historically. So they're on you know levels right around 04, 05. Um, usually in the past, when average inventories have been around at this levels, it's led to a restocking environment. And that restocking environment is usually in conjunction with and aiding in a rising price environment for the commodity. Okay. Uh, what I hear is join Uranium Insider and uh, <laughs> you'll get all the insights. Um, oh, uh, one last uh, couple, couple uh, quick ones. You touched on it earlier uh, with the... Um, at which price does uh, seawater uranium become a thing? So this we're probably not going to see this until the 2030s. But it, do we even have the technology for that right now? Or what what's going on with that? It's being worked on. Um, the Chinese are working on it. There's There was an article about a innovation around seawater extraction a couple of months back. Um, it's nowhere near commercial production. It's still pretty energy intensive. Uh, it's hard to say exactly at what price. I would just argue that we'll reach that price and there's going to be efforts to move towards that. I think eventually we'll see uh, commercial seawater extraction. I'm actually hoping for that. Um, I want to see nuclear expand to the extent that they're saying that they would like to. If we can triple global nuclear by 2050, we're probably going to have to be pulling some out of phosphates and some out of seawater. So... Um, I don't exactly know what price. I would say we're probably close to it, 150 to 200 bucks a pound. If it sustains there, there's probably going to be some decent efforts to figure that out. But the time it'll take from 
technological innovation to commercial levels of extraction is probably multiple, multiple years. So I don't really expect seawater extraction to disrupt this near to midterm investment thesis, let's say now for the next five years or so. But I'm like I said, I'm actually hoping for that innovation to come along in the 2030s. And I think that it will. Um, and again, there's a lot of uranium resources in areas that e are either illegal to mine uranium right now, Australia, certain uh, areas in Australia, and then um, in phosphates. So in Morocco has like what, 80% of the global phosphate resources or something. There's a lot of uranium there. And the US and the Russians have been sniffing around there for years, trying to establish relationships for the future, likely um, cornering of that particular market. So we're going to see supply respond and we're going to see innovations at some price point, but it's got to sustain there. You know, A spike to 200 and drops back down to 100 is not going to do anybody any favors besides speculators that are quick on their feet. Um, it's not going to help innovation in the sector. But I don't think that's going to happen, honestly. I think we see a sustained market here of higher pricing. So, um, so something to watch. But I'm very skeptical of it disrupting this investment for, for many, many years ahead. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're probably not going to catch it in this, uh, in this run. Um, all right. I know you got a hard out. I want to respect that last one. Um, yeah, you also touched on this. Uh, uh, AI uh, demand. Is there any way to model that as far as like increased energy demand and how that could, you know, benefit the bulls in uranium or, or is that just something that, that I don't even know how you'd calculate that? No, it's, you know, just saying that electricity demand is growing is a tailwind for nuclear is kind of a, a blanket statement with a lot of assumptions baked into it. But we can look at the evidence. So what is the evidence? We just saw Amazon buy out Talon Energy's uh, data center precisely because it was being uh, electrified by a nuclear plant that was adjacent to that facility. Um, we started to see articles after this happened about um, is uranium kind of a backdoor play for AI? So what is unique about nuclear when it comes to AI? AI obviously, and not, it's not just AI, right? It's data centers and it's just, it's cloud data centers that are They've been growing and growing and growing for many years, but AI is more, the more recent development that just over the past, you know, 18 months and even less, the average person is starting to become aware of a thing called chat GPT or seeing it being offered when they make a Google search to do an AI version of that search. So um, this has been growing. This is on top of, you know, the growth in electric vehicles and the push to electrify everything, electrify cooking in New York city and electrify heating in, in across Europe. Um, so all of these things are moving towards higher electricity demand. The unique thing is that in developed Western countries, electricity demand has remained flat for the last decade after it was growing since the invention of electricity. Um, so it flattened out over the last 10 to 15 years. Now it's starting to grow again. Where is that going to come from? Well, you can say, oh, but solar is so cheap. It's just going to be solar. Okay. Well, solar is not that cheap when you have to buffer it and you have to buffer it for data centers and AI because you have a lot of different time zones. You have people that are, um, that are going to be utilizing computers when the sun is down, right? So this demand is more inelastic and it's going to need base load power. And if the trend is towards clean energy and baseload, you have two options, nuclear and hydro. Well, every freaking river in the modern world is basically dammed, unfortunately. It's an ecological travesty, but let's not go down that road. Um, if carbon emissions and baseload power are your two concerns, your answer is nuclear unless you have more rivers to dam. And most places don't, especially most places with the data centers. So that would be China, the United States, Japan, the UK, Germany, and a handful of others. Well, all of those countries, except Germany, have substantial nuclear fleets. So at the very least, what we're expecting, and I don't have the data off the top of my head as far as the expected demand growth for electricity, I have heard from uh, very intelligent analysts that they're expecting to see a strained grid with the potential for rolling blackouts and brownouts in the United States within the next 18 to 24 months. Um, if that happens, we're going to see 
money being thrown at the problem. And at the very least, this is going to largely de-risk nuclear shutdowns as far as the likelihood of being granted life extensions in every country with a substantial da uh, uh, data center and AI footprint. So the countries that are growing their data centers, especially AI data centers, and have nuclear power plants, you can practically pencil in the likelihood of most of their uh, reactors that are not falling apart and very, very old to be life extended. So that's that's kind of the baseline. How quickly will we see new builds being supported in some of these countries? Besides China, we know what's happening there, six to eight reactors per year. Um, how about the UK? How about the US? How about Japan? That remains to be seen as far as new builds. Legislation is moving in the right direction. We're seeing some reforms in legislation being uh, promoted for the uh, for the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Association. Okay, so that's happening in the United States, and this is very very good news for new nuclear. It's moving the right direction. What it means for new nuclear, I don't know yet. At the very least, it is a tailwind for life extensions, and we're seeing that, and we're and, and restarts in Japan too. So. Within the next couple of months, we should see um, fuel being loaded into the, uh, let's see if I can say this right. I think it's Kashiwazaki Kariwa. This is the largest nuclear station in the world. It's a seven unit boiling water reactor. Um, the last two units advanced boiling water. Unit number six is going to be restarted this year. The first boiler to restart in Japan. Why is that a big deal? Because Fukushima Daiichi was a boiler and there has not been a boiling water reactor restarted in Japan yet. So. This will set that precedent. It's a very good sign. We're expecting to see three restarts in Japan this year. Keep in mind, they've only restarted 11 reactors since 2011 and three this year. That to me, looks like an acceleration. S sentiment continues to shift in support of nuclear in Japan. So these are good signs. Um, this is just one of those tailwinds that not a lot of people saw coming. I think the electrify everything movement certainly was and is a positive for nuclear. Uh, the AI thing just kind of came out of nowhere. It just, it grew so fast and it took some time for the common person to recognize just what an effect this has. And, and why does this matter? The computing power and therefore the electricity needed for these AI chips and AI searches is far beyond what a, just a basic data center needs to store memory. So you do an AI search versus a standard Google search, it's something like a 10X increase in computing power and electricity demand. Wow. It's huge. It's huge. So if it keeps growing like this, we're going to see constrained grids and we're going to see an enormous amount of money going to fix the problem. Okay. Well, we like the sound of that. That I can't envision a scenario where that would be bearish. Um, all right. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. If... Uh, uh, someone wanted to really dive into the uranium sector and play the alpha in it. Uh, what can they expect if they sign up for Uranium Insider? They can expect um, a very in-depth monthly newsletter, which actually just went out this morning. Um, it was close to 50 pages. They can expect a 100% focused team on this sector. This is all that we do. And we focus a lot on the physical market. <clears throat> Uh, this month, we focused a lot on this electricity demand uh, driver, this tailwind for the sector, which I think is an, a very, very large tailwind. It's, it's like I said, it's difficult to say what it's going to mean for new builds, but it looks very positive either way. You can expect a monthly members-only webinar that's two hours long. We bring industry experts on and we grill them and offer up the opportunity for our members to ask us and our guests questions during that live session. All of this, of course, is recorded and documented. So all of our historical content is accessible for new members. And then we get daily updates. So that is either in written form through what we call a daily data sheet, where we go over the movement of the market, movements of SPUT, the ETF flows, and any newsworthy stories of the day, or uh, a video update. I've been doing a few of these a week. And these video updates are uh, me discussing the movements in the market, anything that's um, timely that needs to be shared with our membership. So basically, as a member, you get your hand held through this process. Of course, we also have our focus list of securities, which we rec have met recommended to our members. 
Um, we are up 440% since August of 2019 compared to uh, 270% for URA, including dividends. So we've uh, almost 2 x the benchmark. And you know what's really interesting? URA is up exactly in line with the spot price since huh. 2019 to the percentage point. Interesting. Yeah. So you can play the ETFs and that's going to give you exposure. It's going to give you exposure to the sector. You can buy spot and play the commodity. But if you had bought what we bought during the same period of time, you would have almost doubled your money on a relative basis. So, um, and of course that's more than a five X of your actual investment since inception. So generally we try to beat the market so far we have, we would like to continue to do so ideally knock on wood. Um, but yeah, things are looking constructive. So that's, that's everything you get in, with our membership. Awesome. Well, I've always said, uh, if you want to play the beta in the sector by URA, if you want to play the alpha, follow Justin, check out Justin's website in the pinned comment below. Uh, it's an affiliate link. If you want to sign up for Justin's newsletter using that link, it doesn't cost you any extra and you support your favorite show in the process. Justin, thank you very much for coming on the show. It was a real pleasure. Always my pleasure. Good to see you again, Steve. You too. And thank you for tuning in. Hit the like and subscribe and share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. It's probably your buddy that can't stop talking about tech stocks. You have yourself a great rest of the day and we will talk to you next time.